On the lunar surface, you have the ability to gather samples that can tell us so much about the origins of our solar system. And the samples returned gave us that information. That was what Apollo 14 did that was so trailblazing. Looks good here, flight good agreement. They continue to believe that this mission might never get started, and Mission Control was pretty convinced it wouldn't either. First attempt, Doc couldn't get a hard dock. Second attempt, third attempt, fourth attempt, fifth, and a sixth attempt. Two hours. But it's that spirit in Mission Control, in the crew, the faith and the confidence in their training, and they're able to work together as a team to really, to get that mission going. I believe I got a hard dock, Ethan. Roger, Al, that's great. Super job, Stu. Oh, this is really a wild place up here. In the aftermath of Apollo 13, nothing was taken for granted. It took a lot of work back home to really reprogram that software, to really understand what had happened there. Apollo 14 was an incredibly ambitious scientific mission. One of the things they had with them that was incredibly important was something called the Met or the Rickshaw. Basically a cart, a cart intended to carry both those scientific experiments, those payloads, but also to return those lunar samples. And so that allowed that crew to travel further from the, from the lander than any crew had previously. Like any good navigator, the astronauts brought with them the maps that they needed. But there was a problem with these maps. These maps had been shot from the air. And on the ground, that lunar landscape looked quite a bit different. Nothing like being up to your armpits in lunar dust. They found themselves in valleys that were deeper than they thought. They found themselves working up hills that were higher. This was an exploration at its finest. Well, I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. That looked like a slice to me, Al. Here we go. And one more. Miles and miles and miles. The samples returned from Apollo 14 were incredibly important. They told us so much about the formation of the solar system, so much about the material that makes up the moon. Okay, uh, I'll do a loop. Okay, make it smooth. And around we go. Go us a little style. The return trip to Earth was a time to rest, a time to reflect, but also a time to continue science. A major portion of that journey home was conducting microgravity science, something that today we do on the International Space Station every day. That was a really a new way to think about what would the value of space be. Apollo 14 achieved all the science that it had hoped to achieve, and it pressed the boundaries of space exploration in ways that future crews would build upon. And as we prepare to go back to the moon, uh, we definitely follow in the footsteps of these brave crews that went before us and build upon the scientific information that they returned. May 5th, 1961, Freedom 7. 
the United States took the first small step on its journey to the moon. America's first man in space, Alan Shepard, rode the Mercury capsule. Lifted to 116 miles by the Redstone rocket's 78,000 pounds of thrust. Ten years later, the launch vehicle is Saturn V, with a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. On January 31, 1971, the crew of Apollo 14 would leave Earth on their mission to the moon. The man who began our first decade of manned spaceflight would command the mission that would close that decade, Alan Shepard. With him, Stuart Rusa, who would orbit the moon alone while Shepard and Edgar Mitchell explored its surface. Their destination, a rugged area of lunar highlands called Fra Mauro. Apollo 13, aborted as it neared the moon, had been unable to land at this site. Now, we were trying again. But why Fra Mauro? What happened to the moon during its first billion years, a period erased on Earth? How do the Earth and moon differ in overall composition? By visiting Fra Mauro, we hope to sample the very bedrock of the moon, material very different from that so far collected, material perhaps dating back to the beginning of the solar system. How can you think of the soil being 4.5 billion years old when igneous rocks, which presumably underlie it, are only 3.5 or 3.7 billion years old? This, I suppose, will be dramatically refuted or confirmed uh, at the Apollo 14 mission when they actually visit from our Most of the activity is associated with one place on the moon, and we have tentatively located that place in or near the crater from Aro. Everything went smoothly during Earth orbit and for the burn that sent Apollo 14 toward the moon. Then Stuart Rusa moved the command module Kitty Hawk to a docking with the lunar module Antares, still attached to the third stage of the booster. And we docked. We're unable to get a capture. Twice they tried. Three times. As the astronauts waited, an identical docking probe was brought into mission control. This probe on the command module fits into a funnel-like device on the lunar module called the drogue. Tiny catches on the probe's point engage the drogue. It was these capture latches that were not holding. In space, the astronauts tried a fourth time. And a fifth. No latch. No, no, no latch. Roger. In space, on Earth, they searched for a solution. Then, on the sixth try... I believe got a hard dock here. As they coasted to the moon, the crew brought the probe inside the spacecraft for examination. On Earth, the probe was tested and retested, for we had to be sure that the probe would work for the most critical docking as Shepard and Mitchell returned from the lunar surface. 
On February 4th, Apollo 14 went into orbit around the moon. This is really a wild place up here. As Apollo 14 was on its first orbit, the third stage of the booster smashed into the moon at its planned target point. Its impact picked up by the seismometer left by Apollo 12. The structure of the moon's interior is one of the major mysteries of lunar science. Now another piece was added that could help solve the puzzle. Later that day, Shepard and Mitchell climbed into the lunar module Antares and undocked prior to descent. And we're free. Beautiful. Very good. But as they checked out the lunar module, a problem appeared. An erroneous abort was being signaled on board Antares and in mission control. Should this occur during the landing burn, Antares would abort automatically and the landing would be off. The mission control team had two hours, the time of one lunar orbit, to find a solution. Flight controller Dick Thorson diagnosed the trouble as a loose particle in the abort button. The burden then came to rest on the shoulders of computer programmer Donald Isles. Working against time at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he reprogrammed the lunar module computer to ignore the false signal. This new program was then checked out in a simulator at Cape Kennedy. As Antares came into contact with Earth again, the instructions were sent up to the crew. Less than 10 miles above the lunar surface, Shepard and Mitchell swept across the landing site. And in Terry's Houston, you're go for Promaro. It's a beautiful day to land at Promaro. Then, another problem. The landing radar, which would tell them their altitude above the lunar surface. Above radar. Crater, a major objective of this mission to Fra Mauro. A hole blasted in the moon's surface eons ago that could provide a scientific clue to the history of the moon, the Earth, and the solar system. We think that the Fra Mauro area was formed from material thrown out by the impact that created the Imbrian Basin to the north. If this is the case, we could get samples torn out from as deep as 60 miles in the lunar crust. All in all, the Fra Mauro material should contain a great deal of new information about the early history of the Moon, and thus help us to better understand the formation of our own Earth. Five and a half hours later, 
Shepard left the lunar module to begin the first of two explorations. Starting down the ladder. Roger. Ten years later, 114 hours, 22 minutes after leaving Earth, Alan Shepard stepped onto the moon. It looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. That's bad for it, old man. Okay, you're right. Alan's on the surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. Four minutes later, he was joined by Ed Mitchell. The last one is a long one. Following the tradition of two previous missions, Shepard and Mitchell planted the flag in the lunar soil. Does this, Bruce, look okay? Roger, yeah, that's a good sight. The next job was to load the Met, a rickshaw-like wagon the astronauts would use to transport their tools of exploration and collected samples. One of the big factors in lunar exploration is mobility. In Apollo 14, we had the MAT, which let us move further afield than the previous two missions. In future missions, we'll use the lunar rover, a sort of moon-going dune buggy. This mobility will mean less time spent in getting from here to there and more time collecting scientific data. Okay, I'm going to stop here and rest for a minute now. Let that thing heavier than I expected. Shepard pulled the Met while Mitchell carried the barbell-shaped package containing an automatic scientific station they would assemble. A station designed to continue broadcasting data to Earth for a year after men departed Fra Mauro. Okay, Houston, we're proceeding over a very fine green regolith they described before. The heavens, that's a deep hole. Going down in the, in the depression. Deep, very deep depression. That's what it looked like. Uh, Roger, you're uh, visible from all about uh, the armpits up right now. Nothing like being up to your armpits in lunar dust. During the Apollo era, six missions landed on the near side of the moon, each with unique stories to tell. Here, we are visiting the Apollo 14 landing site, known as Fra Moro as imaged and mapped by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The base of the lunar module Antares can still be seen on the surface. The orange line is the outbound path that astronauts Al Shepard and Ed Mitchell took on their second moonwalk. Their destination was the rim of Cone Crater, about a mile away on the far side of a fairly steep hill. The trouble was, they couldn't see Cone Crater at any point along the way, and their map wasn't of high enough resolution to be helpful. As they hiked, they had to drag a two-wheel tool caddy called the Modular Equipment Transporter, or MET. In the low gravity and rough terrain of the moon, the MET was always on the verge of tipping over. It took two and a half hours to reach station C1 
30 minutes longer than planned, but they still couldn't see Cone and had to start the return hike to the lunar module. They didn't know it at the time, but as this LRO imagery shows, they had actually come within 150 feet of the crater rim. The astronauts still managed to achieve their science goal, sampling the field of material blasted from the lunar surface when Cone Crater was formed. But they missed the spectacular view, just a few dozen steps from the end of their trail. Finding a suitable site to place the scientific instruments was the next order of business. Shepard and Mitchell now began setting up the automated scientific laboratory. A small nuclear generator to power the array. The central station to transmit data to Earth. A seismometer to detect and measure activity on and within the moon. A series of three experiments to measure charged particles near the lunar surface. An independent experiment to reflect laser beams from Earth, enabling extremely precise measurements of such things as Earth to moon distance, the wobble of the Earth's axis, continental drift, and shifts of the Earth's crust. And a mortar to be fired by a signal from Earth sometime within the next year. The impact of its charges would be picked up by Apollo 14's seismometer. As a final exercise, Mitchell used the thumper, a device to explode a series of controlled shotgun-like charges. The vibrations from these detonations were picked up by a series of instruments he had previously deployed. With the instruments set up and operating, they headed back toward Antares, pausing on the way to collect samples. They loaded their 44 pounds of lunar material aboard the lunar module, and after four hours and 50 minutes on the surface, climbed back into Antares. As Shepard and Mitchell rested, Stuart Rusa continued his work from lunar orbit. His photographs would have meaning not only to the scientific community, but would have direct bearing on the planning for coming missions. Yeah, it's nice to be up a sunny day again. Yeah, it's a beautiful day here at Small Morrow Base. Twelve hours, forty minutes later, Shepard and Mitchell began their second exploration period. After loading the lunar rickshaw, Mitchell began the journey to Cone Crater. Shepard adjusted the television camera, then hurried to join his partner. first stop on the trip to Cone. Here they would collect and document samples, measure the local magnetic field, and take core tube samples from beneath the surface layer. This is a good place for A. They have an appearance here quite often like raindrops, uh, a very few raindrops have splattered the surface. The quality of the scientific description by the astronauts could be termed by Earth-based scientists only as excellent. But now Shepard and Mitchell pushed on. After a brief stop at a second survey site, they began their assault on Cone Crater, a climb not only toward the summit of a lunar mountain, but back through time. A large crater acts in many respects like a drill, throwing out material from deep beneath the surface. This material should be very different from any we've collected before, perhaps dating back to the origins of the moon and even the solar system. And we're starting uphill now. 
maps they were using had been made from photography from lunar orbit. The hummocks, craters, ridges, and boulders took on a new appearance when seen from the surface. against time, against the oxygen and water left in their backpacks, against the alien terrain. Top a ridge, thinking it's the rim of the crater, and there's another ridge ahead of you. Standing in a boulder field surrounded by rocks 10 to 12 feet long, the astronauts made their most difficult decision. With the concurrence of mission control, they stopped their climb, less than 150 feet from the edge, to begin the more important job of collecting samples. The crew had no way of realizing they were so close. It was a week after the mission before we determined this by photographic analysis. While they could overcome the terrain, they could not beat the steady drain of oxygen from their backpacks. In the terms of scientific meaning, the decision not to go on to the rim meant little. In human terms, a great disappointment. One of these boulders, Fredo, is uh, broken open. They're really brown boulders on the outside. The inner face is broken is white. And there's another one that most of it is white. They're right in the same area. The white rock is of different composition to the Apollo 11 and 12 rocks. In fact, the chemistry of all the rocks that have been looked at so far is different to those rocks. Potassium and uranium are ten times higher, which are the sort of values we might expect if the Frau Mauro rocks represent ancient lunar crust, which of course is what we're all hoping. Again it was time. Time to head back to the lunar module. After a quick side trip to check on the science station, they loaded the lunar module with samples and data and stepped off the lunar surface. The second expedition had lasted four hours and 35 minutes, a total exploration of a record nine and one half hours. 33 and a half hours after they landed, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell lifted off in the silent vacuum of the moon. 
Gasm engine is armed. Six, five, four, Go. three, two, one, zero. This is the ignition. What a lift off. And lift off. Roger ignition. Boom. Uh, There's pitch over. Ten seconds. Roger. Hey, baby. It's always good. Everything looks good, Houston. Roger, you're looking good from down here, Al. Coming up on one minute. Half an hour later, Stuart Russo watched their progress from Kitty Hawk. What are you doing way down there, old fearless one? You've lost a little weight since the last time I saw you. Well, right, Houston and Jerry, the station's keeping at about 100 feet, closing in a little more for the pictures of the service module and command module. Okay, I'll do a loop later. Okay, make it smooth. And around we go. Show us a little style. Oh, you look good. There I was at 240,000 coming over the top. That's our home away from home. Would you believe 360,000? Yeah. Kitty Hawk is doing an extremely smooth loop. We're sitting at uh, 70 feet, watching him go around. He looks very clean. The inspection complete. Antares and Kitty Hawk move together for docking. Apollo 14, this is Houston. Your go for the docking. Roger, we got you. They transferred the gear from Antares to Kitty Hawk, buttoned up the tunnel, then jettisoned the lunar module. It would crash into the moon at a predetermined spot. Its impact picked up by their seismometer and the seismometer left by Apollo 12 over a year earlier. 149 hours after they left Earth, they performed the burn that broke them out of lunar orbit. During the coast to Earth, there would be time to catch up on sleep, relax, and do all the little things left undone. And there was one more item, a series of scientific demonstrations in zero gravity, demonstrations impossible to reproduce on Earth. These trials looked at basic physical properties of matter in zero gravity, studies that could lead eventually to new materials manufactured in space for use on Earth. On February 9, 1971, nine days after they left Earth, the crew of Apollo 14 hit the atmosphere of their planet at a speed of over 24,000 miles per hour. They hurtled toward Earth, a meteor heading home. On board, 95 pounds of the moon, extremely important that relates to the question of why, we, why we're fooling around with the moon. It's really that the, the imprint of history, of solar system history, on the Earth-Moon system is centered on the moon for the first billion years. What do we hope to gain is we've got a window right now between t equals zero, the beginning of the solar system, and when the Earth so totally messed up itself that we can't look at it anymore. We'd like to look in there. And that window's on the moon. Apollo 14 has already had a very big scientific impact. And we still have three missions left. They'll be heading into even more rugged and more interesting areas of the moon. Beginning with Apollo 15, 
the lunar rover will let us range further afield and collect more and more varied scientific samples and information. The study of the moon and how, for instance, elements and minerals are distributed in its crust will enable us to learn more about the process of crust formation on Earth, leading to a better understanding of the way that certain elements concentrate in the crust. Will we have had enough missions to the moon by the end of the Apollo program? Probably not. You can never have enough knowledge, but at least it's an excellent beginning. <laughs>